right, so we're live. Welcome everyone, welcome to Chasing Passion, episode five. Thank you so much. I know that those people that watched last week's episode, it was a little bit of a heavy episode. And this one's gonna be a little bit different. This is actually gonna be very different from uh, all the other episodes that I've done. So I have with me on the show, uh, my old friend, uh, Kenneth Hobbs from elementary school and high school. And we are going to spend some time talking about God, uh, Christianity, and just religion in general and society and how we act. Now, the minute that you hear that, I know what everyone's idea is, is just, just run away. I know that there are certain topics that we tend to, you know, there's this old saying that says, you know, we don't talk about politics, religion, we don't talk about child raising, or we don't talk about money. And I really feel like that is a bad omen. I think that we need to start having more of those conversations. I feel like we need to be able to express and have dialogue back and forth. Uh, and I really just feel like Kenneth was somebody that I felt safe talking with about things and, and having dialogue back and forth, knowing full well that I don't really know how he feels. And we've never had this discussion before. So I really like to do these things and go off the top and just see where they go. You know, when I first started this show with Nathaniel, uh, he was one of my close friends who lives near me and he's actually very strong in his faith. Uh, and his album was a album that he made and I felt really comfortable expressing things with him. So I think that that's what we're gonna go with today. And so I'm gonna start off with why I picked you. You've been a really big supporter of the show. Uh, you've, and your advice has been very practical and intelligent and, uh, well-meaning and, and, you know, and it's actually helped steer the show. It's helped steer the show in the direction that I want it to go. And I realized like, these are the kind of people that I want to surround myself with. You know, these are the people that I really want to have in my life. And so on top of that, we have so many, uh, hobby and gaming and nerd interests and our temperaments are similar that I really think this is going to be good. So what I want to start with, with you is actually with a two questions that are not related to our topic today to get you in the mood to do this. The first one is, okay. uh, I ask most of the people that I have on my show, uh, are you, were you raised more process driven or results driven? Uh, meaning were you the type of kid that had slightly more A's and B's you get rewarded or are you the type of, were you the type of kid that was taught to enjoy the process as you go along? What's your thought? Wow. Okay. That is, first off, that is an excellent question. Um, well, I think, um, excuse me. Um, I think, uh, it was a little bit of both. Um, I know, uh, my dad was, an, it was and is a man who, um, likes to challenge and doesn't just say stuff to say stuff. Um, our personalities are naturally very opposite. And a lot of the times he would say things like, is that your best? Um, and just that, that, that healthy challenge, because he always believed that I could do, do better. And so, um, there was a lot of that challenge. And also, um, uh, I'm grateful for both my parents because both of them, um, n uh, never put profiles of what, uh, for, for example, what, what masculinity is supposed to look like. Right. Uh, for instance, I played the flute in middle school for three years, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I played the flute and my dad taking us there. Uh, taking me to the band shop, <clears throat> he didn't say, you know, this is what men do. This is what it's supposed to look like. Well, he didn't say anything. He took me to the instrument shop in Oak Harbor, Washington, and literally just went. Yeah. And he just let me pick what I wanted to pick. I, he had an album from uh, Narada, N-A-R-A-D-A, -A -A, and that's like new age music. It's all instrumental. And I listened to that before I, I took my sixth grade band class, and I got to hear so many different kinds of instruments. And I picked the flute because I liked the way it sounded. Sure. And and really, and to go back to your original question, um, it's just you know, yes, he taught me to enjoy the process. I think it was a mix of both. You know, yeah. I'm a great, I'm great. At that, so. Well, I would say to piggyback on that, I'm really glad that uh, you gave that example because this is something that I really try to do in my own son's life, where you know we provide him with a plethora of toys to play with. So he has a dollhouse, he has dress up clothes, he has a play kitchen, he has action figures. And both my wife and I 
have made the commitment to whatever he's into at the time to fully embrace it. So he plays with his dollhouse and acts out things from his life just as much as he does sports. Um, so I think that's really great. So my second question is, was, what was my second question? Oh, my second question was, where did you get your generally positive, upbeat attitude from? Who did you get it from? How did you learn it? Oh, wow. Okay, the origin of that. Um, a lot of it was just the environment that I grew up uh, uh, in. And I'm grateful because, um, uh, one, my parents did make me feel safe. Um, they, there was a clear understanding of respecting authority, right and wrong. Um, and I didn't feel a lot of pressure to this is what you're supposed to, to be and grow up and look like, you know, like there, there wasn't a lot of that. So a lot of the time, just, just from that, um, I found a lot of joy. Uh, my mom just sacrificing a lot, always making sure there's food on the table. And it was more tr like uh, traditionalist. Uh, my dad was always working. My mom actually didn't work until I was a teenager. So um, you know, just her being home and just, um, it was, there was just so much to be happy about. I really didn't have a lot of worries because there was a, a, a tight family structure. There was always a home. There was a clear bedtime at nine o'clock growing up, all those kind of things. And, and of course, you know, um, uh, without going too far and, you know, being saved at 12 and then like, like some of the, uh, the religious experiences and just growing in the faith. I mean, that happened more so like in my teens, but just again, growing up first, um, I'm grateful because there was a, a solid family structure. Um, and there was, a, there was, there was a healthy, a healthy amount of challenge um, for school and to teach responsibility and to respect authority and all those values that are timeless, right? That, that parents really should be given off to the kids. So that's, that's great. Uh, I, I'm already really enjoying this. I'm going to be honest with you. Like you're really good and concise with your answers. So oh, th this is already a good start, but I think that this is a perfect segue into the question that starts diving into the idea of the faith, which is, which you've already kind of answered a little bit, but I'll give you a two part question. So it'll give you a little bit more to think to answer on, which is the first part is uh, how did your upbringing, uh, the style of upbringing that you have affect your attitudes towards your faith, even when you weren't as in the faith. And the second part of that question is what give, go ahead and give the backstory uh, if you would, of your overall relationship with Christianity from the time you were young up to now. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so uh, first part of the question. Um, hmm. Okay. Could you rephrase? I got the second part kind of in, uh, I'm going to answer that, but the, the first part one more time, you could rephrase that. <clears throat> so the first part of the question was <clears throat> what in the way that you were raised, what attitudes and styles by the way your parents taught you or didn't teach you or what rules they had, how did that affect your feelings about mm -hmm. religion in general? Um, okay. Throughout, like, and an example would be, I know a lot of people who were forced to go to church their entire life and they right. walked out there as, as an adult, they have a really negative feeling of religion and they have a lot of resentment towards it because they weren't allowed to make their own choices. And so those type right. of behaviors negatively affected their feelings towards religion in general. And so my question to you, and I guess I can start off with, well, I was going to do this after you answered, but I can kind of lead in with my own experience was... Uh, sure. I'm very grateful. One of the things that my dad, I think, did actually well was he didn't force me to go to church after a certain age. I think it was after the age of 13 or 14. He essentially said, you can make your own choices and figure out what you want to do. And you don't have to get up if you don't want to. And for me anyways, that was a very positive experience. There was times where I went on my own. There were times without my family, just me by myself as a teenager. There were times like right. I was given some sort of moral freedom to go explore. And so that's why I think as an adult now, I don't have a ton of animosity towards Christianity uh, because of that. So maybe you can start with that. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, first off, thanks for sharing, for sharing your experience and for clarifying. Um, but uh, but yeah, like uh, when I first when I first came to the faith, uh, a friend of mine invited me to church. And first, growing up, uh, my parents taught me morals, values, right from wrong, respecting authority, all all good things that. 
uh, parents uh, parents should do. Um, and I, I, I'll always respect them for that and I always will love them for that. Um, my dad, uh, love him. He didn't try to be my friend. He was my dad. And my mom, you know, again, was, was very loving, but at the same time was very stern and, in, in a good way. So just from that note, when I first got into the faith, the, uh, there wasn't discouragement, um, nor was there a lot of encouragement at first, um, because there, my mom and dad, of course, being their own people during that time, you know, they were in their, you know, thirties, forties, you know, like, and they have their own faith walk to speak on. So, yeah. um, you know, that's where they were at that time. There wasn't like, oh, you can't go to church and it was never imposed, you know? Um, so, uh, a lot of the times, uh, when I got involved, I just loved when, when it first happened, I was 12 and a lot of the incentive was like food. Cause I think I was like maybe <laughs> uh, seventh grade. And like, if you memorize all the books of the Bible, then you'll get a king size candy book. I didn't have a job. You know, so I mean, a lot of the incentive was like food or or friend, time with friends or you know just being able to get out of the house. So a lot, and then it grew into you know teenage years, um, genuinely just enjoying the community of being around those people. That um, it, it wasn't only positive, but there was a sincerity uh, in the in, in what I felt being saved, even though um, there was so much at the time I didn't understand about the Bible. And there's still a lot for me to learn to this day. So I'm not saying, oh, man, I got it all figured out. No, it's not like that. It's just um, I look back at my teenage years. A lot of it was the community um, and just there's the joy of, of growing in that. And um, a lot of my youth leaders, um, the oldest ones were probably in their 50s, but they were so sincere and so um, loving and sacrificing that when I eventually moved into youth ministry in my 20s and was offered a youth pastor position when I was completely underqualified, mm -hmm no degree, like all these other things are like, hey, they just, if it wasn't for my youth leaders and my teachers, and not just the like in the church, but like growing up having great teachers, people of influence who took that seriously and invested in me, that's why I got offered that position in my mid-20s as a youth pastor in the first place, because of the values that were instilled in me. Yeah. So um, I took that position and it was a sincere calling and that was a great season too. Um, and now being in my early thirties and looking back on my faith, I'm grateful for all those times. And it really became real for me. I guess I'm kind of moving into the second question too. Like it really became real for me when, um, someone I love and respect and now we're friends. He was a mentor at the time, the youth pastor before me, he asked me when I was 22, he said, why are you a Christian? And you know, that's it. And even though. I knew in my heart and believed what I believed. I couldn't explain it from very, very clearly from a biblical standpoint. My youth pastor, when I was a teenager, even said, uh, handed her a Bible track. She said, what does that mean? And then she walked away because she wanted me to think. It, because any faith, any belief can't just be emotionally driven because that's like shifting sand. And I'm not trying to preach or whatever, but like emotions come and go. So do thoughts. So it's like, you know, if, if someone's faith is going gonna, is gonna to hold water, obviously it's going to go through trials, but it can't just be emotionally driven because we all go through emotions and they're, they're unstable. So um, I'm grateful for that because from 22 to now, he's discipled me. He's lovingly and humbly taught me the Bible so I can approach that question a little differently and actually have some context. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah, it totally actually makes sense. And I, I think that there's a consistent theme already through the episode with you where, and I think it's really, really important before we kind of start diving into some of the challenges and some of my, my thoughts and my feelings and we start going back and forth, I would say some of the themes I'm already picking up from you are, is what I would was hoping that you were going to say, which is that you had uh, parents and institutions in your life that had some level of uh, moral um, ethics and they taught you values. And so mm -hmm. it allowed you and you believe those values and these people are ethical. And, and so you believe the lessons that are coming from them because they're, they're acting it out in a certain way. You know, they're not, I've always thought that Christianity in general was something that, uh, you don't really have to say that you are all the time. You can just act it out and just say, hey, I'm trying to be a decent person and here I'm trying to act out these values and trying to forgive people and trying to do things. And you don't really have to talk about it because when you're acting out a certain behavior, people tend to kind of know that you're a certain kind of way and they just say oh look i see this guy's actions he's being kind he's being authentic he's he's being you know upright and that i think 
is super, super, super important, which is why I think that you look on things so favorably. So I want to look through my questions really fast. And so I guess we'll start moving into some of the heavier topics. And I would say my feelings from religion are... Wow. So... Yeah, it's a lot. You know, it's a really heavy topic, and I'm glad that we get to talk about it in this way. There's definitely the component that you're talking about that I feel like is missing um, from my life and from a lot of people's lives. One is the great sense of community that um, I really got from the church when I was younger, which was I wanted to do some volunteer work a, a little while back because I thought it would be really great for me to have an experience of doing something working at a food bank or just doing something to give back to my community where I was directly uh, helping people out. And mm -hmm. I went online and I signed up and I noticed that every place that I signed up for was like, there was like a two eight hour training classes and a bunch of forms that you had to fill out. And it felt you know, you already, by your nodding, you already know what I'm saying. It felt very corporate. It felt like a job. It no longer for me felt authentic. It never felt like I, what I wanted to do was just like, Hey, I have this Saturday free. I'd like to come help out this Saturday. And I think when you're in a, when I was in a church, I had more of a capacity to do that. And I know that it kind of sounds a little bit selfish and it is, um, but I wanted, when I was with the church, I had the ability to do those things more frequently. And I do miss that, like making meals for people, helping other people out with it, like those type of activities. Um, I do miss those. And there are a lot of other things that I feel in my life, which I have been struggling to rectify in my own head, like celebrating Christmas, for instance, like it loses a little bit of its meaning if if you're not fully in it, like if you're not fully in the faith, like the celebrating of Christmas doesn't feel as powerful if you're not actively involved with what's going on and you, or if you don't believe as strongly, it kind of feels just like really surface level and like, um, like you're just doing gifts and you're just kind of running through the motions. So sure. I would say that um, there's definitely in my friend group and in the people that I know, there's a ton of, I can name probably a hundred people that have were raised in the church of some capacity and that mm -hmm. have left. And I'm wondering what your personal perspective is on that. Sure. Um, okay. Well, first off, um, thanks for what you shared because uh, well, let me let me go ahead and address what you just said. So, um, I think it's very easy, especially for people who have either grown up in the church or it started young, where um, a lot of it can be emotionally driven. And I think I have I have an empathy for who for people who are if I were to like categorize people at, in two different categories, like emotionally feeling driven and then logical thinking driven, right? So me being obviously with a more feely emotional type, right? Um, I kind of have an empathy for, for those and in some ways envy those who are more logical because I'm naturally not like I've, I'll start by just saying like, you know, yeah, I was born, I was born a sinner just like, like everybody else in this world. So I think it's so healthy for anybody, especially those seasoned Christians who have been in the church and, you know, for like 50, 60 years to always remember grace. Okay. Remember that and, you know, none of that was earned. You know, Jesus did what he did before any of us were alive. And I think that's a level playing field, regardless of what anybody believes in, because that that just takes away all the labels of atheist, agnostic, Christian, all that other stuff, right? Because that levels the playing field. And even though I've been saved for 20 years, like, I think that's a great playing field to start from, because uh, I could see a lot of people, and I'll, I'll play the, uh, I'll play the, uh, the anti-Christian for a second. Like, I could see a lot of people leaving the church from being judged, from not being accepted, from um, uh, you know, from people losing sight of uh, what it's really about, and for the Christian, for someone who has given their life to Christ, it's about following Jesus and becoming more like Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not just 
Otherwise, it really is just a religion of, of just of just doing things of our own strength, right? Um, changing my way of thinking or following this set of rules in order to da da da, which unfortunately there's a lot involved in the church that that are slow to teach scripture and teach more their preference or their theology or all those secondary things without teaching the fundamentals first and saying, okay, here's what it's about. Here's where you were. By grace, you can move forward and change. And, and, and thankfully, he does that changing in you so that you don't have to merit those things, right? And I think going back, again, going back to the original question, like um, a lot, I could see there was there were periods of time periods of time where, where I didn't go, not necessarily because anybody like burned me or whatever it was, but because I was impatient, you know, like there were times in the 20 years that I've been a Christian, um, I followed and didn't follow where I literally had my Bible to the left. And, and so it was my heart and I was just doing whatever I wanted to do. And what's even harder too is whether or not a person's a Christian is dealing with the consequences of that. Right. And I think it's even harder for the Christian because they hear the truth and know the truth and they turn from it. And when we do that, there are still consequences. It's like a loving parent telling a child, if you don't follow the rules, you still have to deal with the consequences. It's the same thing as a Christian. If you decide to not listen to God anymore, not listen to Jesus anymore, and you think that whenever you turn back and ask for forgiveness, you, those consequences aren't there, that's still going to be there. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, just like serving time or whatever it is. So to, to go back, I mean, I, I can totally empathize with those who have been burned by the church because that sucks. I mean, there, there, there's some people that are way prideful and need to be humbled. That's just really what it is. And, and yeah, so. Do you, so my, my follow-up question to that then as we're thinking about it is, do you personally feel like this is a church problem? Like the church needs to evolve in general or do you think that this is an indiv individual problem where individuals need to be able to see beyond that issue? Because I would actually, I would actually, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll, I, Go ahead. I actually, I totally actually lost my train of thought. I actually think it's a little bit of both, but I agree with you that the reasons that you're saying that people have left are the reasons that people have stated to me, you know, the high, a high level of, of uh, people that are leaving is in the Catholic church and you know, the Catholic church is extremely strict about their traditions and their, and the way that they do things. And uh, I see people leaving that in droves and I'm so, I'm wondering maybe if the balance, but in the, within the individualized churches, if the balance between uh, empathy and judgment um, or forgiveness and judgment is off a little bit. Oh, for sure. Like, uh, Man, I mean, first off, you hit the nail on the head as far as it. Well, one, I agree with you, too, and that it, I believe it's both because there's a responsibility when a, a position is taken within the church because um, those people should be quicker to remember grace because they didn't earn any of those positions. I can support that scripturally, which is which is not time for that now. But it's just I mean, the whole the whole thing is, is again, Jesus did what he did before either of us were alive. And he reached out to us first and, and put that calling and all, and all those things. Right. So I think. It's so important for, for people to know their place first, remember who they were before they heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, like I remember what I was doing when I was in my early 20s and I set my Bible aside. I was learning how to pop and lock and I was in the club and everything. And like the same guys that, you know, and, and then, you know, four years, later, four years later, I'm a youth pastor. Like I certainly don't want to forget my ways and how my family has shown me grace and did not forsake me in my unwise decisions in my 20s. Sure. Right. Because they're, you know, so I think. Um, again, just going back to that place of, okay, like, I don't want to forget what he's brought me from and what, where he's bringing me to. And again, it's, I think it's a mix of both because there's a lot of people that, that work for the church that are quick to judge and forget, you know, Hey man, you've been showing a lot of grace, you know, just because, and, and, and also there's a danger in, um, you know, just the love of money and it's, and, and just taking, and, and of course teaching out of context, you know, it's just like trying to talk about a TV show from season three, episode two, but you haven't even started from the beginning. Yeah. So you're teaching, you know, just giving, giving them, you know, puzzle pieces randomly, but then not giving them, not, not teaching well, you know, cause a good teacher will, will get, will give them the context and give them the, and give them the understanding and also meet them where they're at. So there's all of these, again, going back to what you said, I, I agree with you. It's a combination of both the individual's responsibility to seek truth because they can't just blame everybody all the time. Yeah. You know, you really want to know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you're even doing this. 
you know, you're reaching out and there's a lot of passion there. Yeah. So um, to answer your question directly, it's a, I believe it's a combination. So Yeah, I'm going to use that as a segue to dive into my struggles with it and sure. my thoughts on it. And then you can kind of give me what you think after that. So I think that I would say I'm much more logic based um, than emotion based. And so I would say that the more that we learn, the more, the more that science is proving as the study of things is proving things, it's harder and harder for me to conceptualize like a God as a physical man in the sky, either in the sky or in some, in some universe or something beyond what we can comprehend. Uh, I would say that a, a couple more of my struggles are, I struggle with the idea that there are so many different denominations uh, of Christianity. And to me, the, what I struggle with in that is that what it says to me as a logic-based thinker is, that no one really has it quite figured out like what the right the right way of doing things is everybody has their own interpretation and i think it seems to me that there is a slight variation on everybody's interpretation of what it means to be saved uh for instance i'll go to some church you know you go to some strict churches i've been to some where you're not allowed to have communion uh if you're not a member of the church some some stricter, more conservative churches. Uh, you're you have to be an active member of the church in order to have communion, um, and some are not that way, and some are very open. and And my issue is not whether it's open or closed. My issue is uh, that there's variance. So if I'm even going searching for answers and I'm looking for some institution or some infrastructure, uh, they're all different. And so for me, it becomes harder for me to align myself with someone because mm -hmm. and no one really seems to have the right answer. I mean, I think at the core, it still is the same. Uh, I think that it still is, uh, you have to have, have faith and you have to believe uh, the words and to me, act them out. If you actually are believing them, you're trying to act them out in, in reality. Um, so that part I actually think is, is um, I do believe that. Um, and there's one, so when I was really trying to study, when I was actually in high school, I actually was debating between two different career paths. Uh, one was actually to be a pastor uh, because I felt a lot of the feelings that you felt. Uh, I felt like I had a, a natural ability to publicly speak. Um, and I felt that I enjoyed the environment of the church, but I felt that I was making my decision based on the fact that I felt good as opposed to actually believing in the words themselves. And when I pressed myself, I would say, I don't actually believe this. How can I go up and preach something and go to seminary and go to school for something that I'm not a hundred percent convinced of? And the other was a chef. So there was a time where, you know, I was going to the Bible retreats where I was reading the Bible, where I was highlighting it, where I was really engaged with Bible study. And I was doing those things and studying the scripture, uh, even beyond, even into my twenties. Uh, but I also found from my own perspective that I utilized God in such a way, in the concept of God in a way where I was using it as an excuse to not take action, almost out of fear. So I would say, oh, God's going to make this happen, or why is why is God not making this happen? And the minute that I kind of stepped away from God for a moment, the idea of God for a moment, I and started taking action on my own, and actually, mm -hmm. I, number one, began to feel more empowered, and uh, number two, I, I began to struggle even more with it because I think conceptually in my mind, I said, well, you know, I'm no longer relying on God as a concept to really govern my ideas. And I'm starting to think for myself. Um, and so my feelings are changing. And now as a, as a, a parent, I'm shifting, I'm shifting back closer to spirituality, maybe not within the church. And I think a lot of people feel this way. And it was a huge reason why I wanted to do the show, honestly, is because I feel like when you talk to people, the loudest people out there are these really, these two really strong camps. You have one, the one camp that's really loud and like believes in the faith and they're really preaching it. And then you have the atheist camp that's like, 
you, there, you are an idiot if you believe in God. Like, if you even believe, and those are the only two voices that you're mm -hmm. hearing on any, on anything, politics, anything. And the reality is, is that the nuances of conversation are much more subtle. And it's already like, I'm happy with what's happening in this conversation because it's agreed. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's like we're having, this is what people are. They're complicated. I will say, that one of the redeeming qualities when I started doing my research, one of the redeeming qualities that I actually think aired towards me believing it a little bit more, believe it or not, was when is it Mary that goes and finds the tomb empty? It's Mary, right? Mary Magdalene that goes and finds the tomb empty on the third day. So mm -hmm. what I found compelling about that evidence was that if somebody was trying to create a giant conspiracy that this happened, they probably at that time in that time period, they probably wouldn't have had two women find him empty because in my, my logic is that women at that time were treated as like kind of like property in a certain sort of sense. Like well, they had their role, but they weren't viewed as like, the people that are you're going to trust equal that you're going to go to and that you're going to trust. And so that actually lended um, a level of that actually lended a level of um, credibility to the story itself. So I'm going to let you respond to that. And then I'm going to uh, go into the last section of the conversation and then see where we go from there. Like, is there anything about what I said in my struggles with it that stood out to you? Okay. Um, let's see. Well, first you shared a lot of good things there. And um, I would start by, I would start by saying, well, let me just share just like a, a few like personal experiences having been in the South for 14 years versus uh, just there's a different parts of the U S yeah. uh, being more in a, a very much so more hyper conservative area versus growing up in Washington state where primarily most of it's liberal. Yeah. So um, it's been uh, healthy in the sense of just being challenged um, in um, just really seeing different kinds of struggle from a racial standpoint and also from a, from a spiritual standpoint too, in that there are so many, just in this small County that I live in, and I've been here for about 14 years, there's like over a hundred churches in uh, an area that's, yeah, 50,000 people, but there's like square miles. It's like, it's it's not that much. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's less, a lot. It's less than a miles. There's a lot of, and, and, and just even on that demographic alone, it makes it, makes it seem like there's so much division, Yeah, you know? And, and I think a lot of the root of that is pride. A lot of that's um, uh, just a lot of just human things that everybody struggles with. And I think, Again, this is where the church kind of needs to be more transparent and honest of their own insecurities, of their pride issues, of their shame issues, and should and should feel of all the places that they should feel accepted because Jesus truly does accept people as they are. And it's not just a figure of speech. It's like it's not clean yourself up and then you can walk inside of a building. Because without getting too preachy, the biblical church isn't a building anyway. Biblically, and just even just on that note, like before getting into like the secondary stuff and denominations, speaking in tongues, all that other stuff that's easy to like get into the nuance and the details of things, like foundationally and fundamentally, like if a person believes that Jesus is who he says he is, because it's just in the book of John, he makes, cl he makes claims of his own divinity, right? And an individual person, uh, uh, just because they're raised in those things, there becomes a point where the whole age of accountability thing, that's not clearly said in scripture, but whether they're five years old or 14 years old, when it clicks in their mind, okay, do I really believe this stuff? And honestly, uh, if, the, if the teacher who is teaching out of the Bible, whether they're a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or whatever, they need to say that the people in the Bible that's written by 40 different authors, you know, many of whom didn't meet each other, da 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 like all those people struggle with doubt. Yeah. Look at Peter. Peter, man, I mean, he messed up so many times falling in the water when Jesus said, don't look anywhere else to walk on the water, start falling in the water. He denied Jesus three times. And guess what? God gave him the grace to write first and second Peter in New Testament. There's so many examples of, I think James, uh, in the book of James, New Testament, like I think James was Jesus' half brother. 
And James didn't even believe Jesus was God until post-resurrection. And then James probably had like a aha moment, like, oh, wow, my brother really was what he said he was. He wasn't just like speaking word prophecies or whatever it is. And, and even like giving props to C.S. Lewis saying like Jesus is either who he said he was or he was a heretic and a lunatic. And uh, Lord forbid that I ever say that, but that truly is because he makes he he indirectly and directly says he's God. And I think that's foundational because it's easy to take everything out of the Bible out of the context because you, you hit the nail on the head. It's so easy to take everything out of context out of the Bible and nitpick everything and veer away from who Jesus is because just his name brings conviction. It, it, just just his name. It has at this way it's been in the past, and that's how it's going to be in the future. That's why there's so much debate, like you mentioned, with uh, that's just one reason why there's so much debate between um, super quick to preach, super judgmental, loud Christians that are slow to show their actions and fruit and being loving and humble to people and say a lot of stuff in the pulpit, but then you see the duplicity in their lives and they're slow to acknowledge it. And there's hardcore people that are more honest from an atheistic standpoint and have a closer chance of actually getting to know who Jesus the Christ is by being honest with themselves. I give you props and I'll, and I'll make it personal for a second again. And then I'll, I, I guess I can conclude with this is like, um, I was so quick to jump on the bandwagon in my mid twenties before being honest with myself and dealing with a lot of the things that I had to deal with before taking such a, a position of responsibility, because to be a youth pastor, to be a teacher, I'm not just teaching, you know, information. Like the manners that I'm teaching hold eternal implications as to de, as to it, it, truth and error in these young people's lives. And I look back at my time, and though it was sincere and very passion driven, there was a lack of maturity on several levels and a duplicity that my family saw in my own life because there were things that I was doing behind the scenes without getting too specific. It's gonna be live, obviously, that weren't completely surrendered to Jesus. And this is why I give you kudos, because you were quicker to be honest with yourself than I was. And I've been shown a lot of the grace since then. Uh, oh, hey, my sister just walked in. I'm sorry, I'm doing like a live like podcast thing. So uh, so anyways, but, but to wrap up, man, it's just, um, if I were to kind of take all of that and put it like in a little nugget nutshell, um, you hit the nail on the head again, is that these honest conversations. Um, yeah, yeah. What's up, Ness? Did you put this piece down here or did I? Uh, you probably did. Okay, but yeah, but these honest conversations should happen, and they, and and to leave off on a positive note, they are happening because there are some grace-filled, humble churches with filled with people that are very honest, and you know it's just it's just like if someone really wants to know um, truth, if someone really wants to, to 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 seek those things out, first God understands that, period. He understands that people are seeking truth. And if he is who he says he is, then they will be led there. And just the heart, and, and it sounds, you know, super like spiritual. All oh, the timing is, you know, but, but really, like, as we, I, since we're in our thirties, and we can look back at just the different seasons of our life, like, you know, if we had gotten what we wanted at that time, at that time, would it really have been the best? Yeah. I'm, so, I'm you know sorry what I mean? to interrupt. What's I'm up? To go to mom and dad's house. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, hey, um, Georgia's sick, so oh. dad has to take George to the vet. So oh, okay. just pray that his cat's going to be okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because I'm about to drop this off. Oh, jeez. Okay. Good looking out, man. Um, sorry for the little bit. You're all good, man. <laughs> you, can, you can edit this out if you want, man. But okay. Um, be safe, Ness. Love you. All right. But uh, but yeah, man, that's just the... Uh, uh, how long am I on time, by the way? I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of rambling a little no, bit. No, you're, to you're totally fine. You're at, like, we're at like 45 minutes, so we can wrap up in like 15 minutes and we'll be... Will be good, and I I think that this conversation in general is gonna have a part two to it because it's such there's such a lot to talk about, uh, and it's been yep. really it's been quite enjoyable um, chatting with you and unloading some of these things and being honest and going back and forth. So I mean I've really really enjoyed it. Um, Same. So I'm gonna say something interesting because I don't I'm. <laughs> I want to hear your perspective and then we can go forward. So towards the end of this conversation, what are your feelings about Peterson? And okay. my feelings are 
after you give your response, I'll tell you what I think. And because he's actually pulling me, has pulled me as a logic-based thinker back closer to the faith. Nice. So why don't you tell me what you think? Because he's kind of controversial, but to me, not really. But to a lot of people, he is. So I want to know mm -hmm. what your personal feelings are. Sure. Uh, first off, you hit a, a very important word, just controversial, right? Um, I think a lot of people, um, especially whether they're young or old in the faith, just being a Christian is controversial. I mean, Jesus talked about it. I mean, he was persecuted because it's it's um, uh, it has been just just to be in the faith is controversial, and to be not in the I mean, it's just, and and it's it's unfortunate because we're in such a, a PC culture that to, to to disagree with anything, oh no, that's wrong. But I mean. Everybody has their views, and that should be respected, and I'm glad we have this mutual respect. Now, to go back to your original thing with uh, Jordan Peterson, um, you know, I think, one, he's incredibly intelligent and incredibly accomplished and all those things, and that's, and that's awesome. Second, um, I'm glad that he has, from what I've seen so far, not only is it entertaining from, sure, a sarcastic and, like, funny satire point of view and just, like, humbling, you know, millennials and young people that are quick to share their opinion, but but slow to earn that place, right? To be able to share their opinion, you know, he because he can shut down people pretty quick. Um, uh, I think, I think he he has a degree of humility, and he has um, now. Is he my favorite? Personally, no, but like um, I do appreciate the fact that he is he is willing to disagree, and he's willing to. Um, I have seen videos where he is willing to let. Um, other people who are clearly, clearly one being rude, clearly indirectly displaying their insecurities, and he, he'll just be quiet and be like, "Look, man, like you don't even know what you're saying. Like it's just you know, and it's just one, it's just one of those like I just yeah. and I can appreciate that, and and it's tough because um, you know wh whether someone's a Christian or not, like just dealing with that pride, and, and when you feel like you're in your element, it's it's so easy to be like, oh, this is my zone. I'm confident in this. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna bust. It's just like weightlifting. You go into the gym and guys go, oh, man, this is my blah blah blah. And you know, Jordan Peter, that that's his element, you yeah. know. And for him for him to be able to say, to, uh, there was this one YouTuber I'll end on this is like, um, you can tell when somebody has a degree of wisdom is when they allow others to be wrong or to make fools of themselves and you can they can just be like okay yeah. so I, i'm so glad that that was your opinion because honestly he has a five-part series on the biblical stories where mm -hmm. he dives into the stories like at the root like he loves talking about cain and abel and essentially like how these stories are like they've survived 2000 years. We should probably not get rid of them right away. Those, those lectures that were non-political, you know, they were just about the biblical stories were the things that kind of shifted me as a logic based thinker back towards more towards the faith than away because he has such a profound knowledge and understanding of like these condensed stories that are three or four sentences long that just have so much meaning like in in 2019 that i was like it added some credibility back to the stories themselves and actually made things a lot more clear for me uh i don't you know i really don't like talking politics too much but because I think it related to the religious aspect, I felt it was appropriate to bring him up. I also believe that he's kind of bridging the, I think that in some ways he's become his own sort of church in a way, in a metaphorical sort of way, because he's bridging, in my opinion, he's bridging the gap between the intellectual community and the working class community because he's not harsh and judgmental towards the working class community and he's super, super smart. So his, <laughs> His stories have actually brought me closer back to center. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, closing statements are this has been really good. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. You've had a lot of insights. And I, I think that we'll definitely do a part two of this. And <laughs> and I felt completely like respected with your conversation and your insights and the way that you handled it and just – taking time to pause and think and wrapping questions up and everything else. So it's been really great. Do you have anything that you want to add at the end? Um, well, well, first off, just for 
one, thanks for the opportunity, man. Like for real, like I, I enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I enjoy uh, conversations, uh, hanging out with people. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned a, a while back that you, uh, you know, uh, felt uh, public speaking. Like as as much as I've uh, given speech, I, I'm always nervous in front of lots of people. I'm much more comfortable with this setting. Yeah. You know, like coffee shop versus like you know a pulpit or a college presentation. Yeah, or for sure. Like, so, so just on that note, but but yeah, man, it's been very very enjoyable. I look forward to part two. Um, you know, and and just. Uh, um, it's, it's funny. I guess I don't know this. Like I just finished my bachelor's in psychology, which is exciting. And I'm glad that it's done. Congratulations. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, and, uh, I think it's, I'm grateful because, um, as someone who loves Jesus, I'm glad I can be, you know, in the college community, be, be embedded in the culture. And I guess I would end off this is that, you know, for anybody watching this or for anybody that, that has listened or is going to listen, um, you know, if, if you are in the faith, you know, grow in that. And at the same time, you know, we're not meant to stay in our little bubble. You know, we got to go and, and talk to people and not just go and share the word, but but do life with them and and, 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 and love people by by accepting and, and just hearing them and, and getting to know them. Um, just being involved with the because uh, I went back to uh, uh, the college when I was 27. Now I'm now 32, but uh, that's why I started my degree in psychology. It's funny that. I started my degree in psychology with the intent to understand other people, but it forced me to understand myself and yeah. face myself, yeah. right? And that's healthy for anything. That's super and, important. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, to, to introvert the extrovert. You know yeah, what that's I mean? exactly so, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, uh, it, it was good, man. It was good because I got to, you know, it's it's been it's been a, a blessing and some really good things. So so yeah, man. That's uh that's what I like to leave off on and um. You know, I look forward to part two and, and where, where this goes for you. I'm excited. Thank you. We'll stay on the line. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope that this brought you value. I hope that people can see that, you know, most people that you meet in the world are just normal people. And they're complicated and they have their issues. And there's much more intricacy to conversation than just black and white. I think a lot of times we want to shortcut things. There's nothing that human beings love more than convenience. And the reality is, is that there isn't anything convenient about conversation. It's messy. Sometimes there isn't resolution. Sometimes it gets boring. Sometimes there's, it, it, we go off on a tangent, but the reality is this is all part of being human. I think, you know, I, I don't like to get too preachy, but there are a few things that I think that are missing from our culture that I've been trying to embody with my family, which is, uh, you know, sitting around a fire, uh, having family meals together and uh, having long form conversation are essential human activities. So uh, stay safe and uh, we'll talk again in a week or so. All right. Take care.